Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim, uh, a moderator, an old friend of the World Bank Group. Uh, let, me first, let me first start by thanking the uh, organizers for this event, uh, for inviting me and the World Bank Group to such a fascinating and very timely um, international conference. I'm particularly delighted to be here for three reasons. Uh, one is, obviously, I'm a woman uh, from a developing country who has devoted most of my career life uh, in development, in particular looking at uh, women. Um, I'm also a mother of a daughter, so this topic is quite uh, personal in that sense. Uh, second, the institution I represent, the World Bank Group, takes gender very seriously. Actually, I was very pleased to hear uh, Minister Kim's presentation, uh, including um, quite some fascinating policies that her ministry is trying to put in place, because we as an institution went through exactly the same thing about two decades ago. And this came out of our own internal analysis why there were not many women in high-level positions. So the topic of gender and growth and development is at the core of what the World Bank Group uh, does. Uh, third, and probably more importantly, as we've heard before from previous speakers, the current administration here in Korea is quite ambitious on this topic. Uh, and we do work hand in hand with the government. Uh, we do support their target of increasing the um, age uh, population workers from the current 64% to 70% in 2017. So I find the, the, the current conference, including the very rich data that has been presented, quite timely. Uh, my presentation will focus mostly on the global picture, just to get an idea what is happening. Um, I'm also quite pleased that the previous speakers actually presented data which is very similar to what I'm going to present. So the story is quite consistency. Uh, we've looked at different sources of data, but the storyline is the same. The conclusion is the same. Uh, we find Korea particularly fascinating because unlike other countries, including developed countries, Korea has such a rich human capital in women, both in education but also in committing themselves to education, which you don't find in a lot of countries. And that is a very good baseline to start with. Uh, and that's something that we should all be proud of. Um, okay, so my presentation will focus on three things, essentially. Women and growth, why does it matter? I think we, we have the convictions from earlier presentation, the global context, looking at the data from different sources, what is happening, particularly in the, um, what we call the best performers, countries that have consistently performed quite well, in particular in OECD countries. I will focus on two specific examples. One is Finland, the other one is France, simply because France has made a big jump in this particular year. And Finland, like other Nordic countries, they have consistently scored quite high on female participation in the labor force market. I would try and present, again based on research, what are the key drivers behind these uh, best examples, behind the success stories, and sum up my presentation with a conclusion. So first, there are different definitions of uh, women economic empowerment. Uh, I like to use the one presented by Eben from 2008, which essentially define women's economic empowerment as a capacity of women to, to participate in, contribute to, and benefit from growth processes in ways which recognize the value of their contributions, their impact, respect, their dignity, and make it possible for us to negotiate a fairer distribution of the benefits of growth. Why does it matter? Because studies after studies, consistent with what we've heard before, it does make a difference. 
whether it's from the income growth, whether it's from the parent perspective, when your daughters, when your sons go and see mommies go to work, it does make a difference from the inspirational standpoint. Uh, it is central to economic development. We've heard earlier on the data on the potential convergence of labor force divergence that you see in men and women in some countries and how that can positively influence economic growth. Um, if you look at a number of studies, including our own and those presented by the International Monetary Fund, uh, they have shown, and we've seen from the previous speaker, that women participation is central to economic growth and development. And as Christine Lagarde, the head of IMF, put it very nicely, when women do better, economies do better. So what are the facts? This is a, a summary of some of the facts from a 2012 OECD study, which is actually fascinating, but also not new in many ways. I mean, you see the same stories at other countries, including developing countries. Uh, the study showed that eliminating, eliminating the gap between male and female participation would create a growth dividend of 12% by 2030. If you look at the current uh, growth rate for most countries, including in this region, the average is about 3.5 up to 5%. So the potential of actually closing the gap and the economic benefits from it are just enormous. Um, if you close the gap just by 50%, you're talking about a potential 6% growth boost across the OECD countries. This is quite significant, again, compared to the current rates of 3 to 4% for most developed countries in terms of growth. The same study looked at five APEC countries, Australia, Canada, Japan, US, uh, Republic of Korea, and New Zealand, actually six countries. And uh, again, the data show that if you just increase a 50% shift of women participation in the labor market, uh, you're bound to get between 3.5 to 9.8%, with Japan and the Republic of Korea having the most benefits because they have scored consistently low in this particular area. So what does this say? For us, it says that, number one, Korea is starting from a very strong base despite the fact that it's a bit lower, it's number 10 in OECD countries, as you would see from my next graphs, but it still has a huge potential to actually make a leapfrog uh, progress. The government is committed, which is a good thing. In most countries, in some countries, you have a government that is not committed. I think in this particular case, the message is very clear, and we heard it from Minister Kim and other speakers. The goal is quite ambitious, 70% by 2017, but it's doable. And if other countries that don't have the benefits that Korea has could actually do it, I do believe that Korea can do it. Um, we also believe that, um, especially with the aged population uh, demographics that you currently see in Korea, if you do actually want to increase the segment of the uh, labor market, having women participate will actually mitigate the risk that you currently uh, potentially could run with the demographic changes. Another issue is household debt. Studies after studies have shown that if women participate, the household income will go up, and that has the potential of reducing the household debt trends that you currently see in Korea. Um, the low female participation in Korea, again, implies that Korea is not utilizing to its maximum potential this strong human capital base of highly educated women uh, that currently exist in Korea. Uh, there is a fascinating study that um, shows uh, from 2012, from uh, Goldman Sachs, actually, that shows in 2012 more women graduated from Korean universities than male. But if you look at the data from 2013, 
the numbers of women in the labor force were actually lower. So the notion of supply and demand here and the drivers behind it, some of the structural changes that we've heard from the previous speaker do contribute but can be fixed. And I think the Ministry of Gender, as we've heard this morning, is moving in the right direction. So here are the facts. Um, again, this is the graph from OECD Employment Outlook from 2013. It shows the total employment and where Korea falls vis-a-vis -vis other OECD countries. And also you have a straight line which shows the government target uh, of 70% by 2017. Um, again, you know, Korea is not the worst in terms of number one, but it has the potential. It's way below the OECD country. Uh, we believe as Korea increasingly dominates the global agenda as a powerful force in G20, as a bridge between developing countries and developed countries in OECD DAC, it does set a precedent and example for other countries to follow. And we will do what, whatever we can to support uh, Korea in this regard. The next graph, again from the same studies, shows uh, female employment. The other one was total. And if you look at female uh, numbers, they are even lower than the total. Um, the high level of education, 64%, between the age of 25 to 34 years of age, and this is the highest in OECD countries. But also you have a very low female participation in the job market uh, of 53.7%. So let's look at the good examples. This is from the World Economic uh, Forum study, uh, which looked at the global gender gap. Uh, they looked at 49 high-income countries, which I will focus on, including the OECD countries. And Iceland and Nordic countries were leading the way. And they have been leading the way for a while. Uh, the key driving factor which again is consistent with what we've heard before, is really having the right types of policies and environment to promote and in support of work-life balance. Um, Finland, if you look for example, is the second best on labor force participation and wage quality of similar work, and it has been so for a number of years. Uh, the country has 42% of parliamentarians who are women, and 50% of ministers who are women. So the political capital, the representation, is quite rich. Uh, it has the highest share of women employed in non-agricultural employment. High ability to raise to positions of leadership. High share of women on boards of listed companies. 14% from Finland, 17% Sweden, 37% for Norway. Korea has 2% according to 2010 data. So that shows where Korea is vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And even when you look at Korea women representation on boards, it's even lower than countries such as Philippines, which has 10%, China and Thailand, which has 7%. So there is a bit of margin where Korea could actually move upwards even in the private sector. Again, in uh, Finland, you have the highest ranking on length of paternity coverage. This morning we heard from Minister Kim about what her ministry is trying to do vis-a-vis -vis the issue of fathers being a partner in raising children. Uh, the country Finland has a long culture of female inclusion in politics dating back to 1906. It is the second country to introduce right to vote for women, which is remarkable because most of us, you know, usually we tend to underlook how long women have been involved in, uh, in, in politics. Another country example is France, and I put France on the slides for one main reason. If you look at the same study, the World Economic Forum, France is one country that made the biggest jump compared to the last uh, report. And the reason is, the key reason, is the significant improvements in educational attainment and health and survival gender gaps survey indicators out of this study. Now, I'll focus on the education attainment 
this is where again Korea has a huge advantage say over countries such as France because you already have such a very rich human capital uh, France also produced uh, a family work-life balance policy the empirical evidence on its impact is still a bit too early but it looks promising that it did actually make a difference in a country moving up um, Again, France is the second best country after Norway on share of women on boards. And if you read the surveys, having more women on boards actually inspired even more women, including mothers who were stay at home, to actually get out and go to work. So the regulatory environment, the conditional environment made a big difference in France. The next slide just shows the aggregate value of different countries, the data on women economic participation. And again, you can see towards the right hand side at the bottom, the picture is dominated by Nordic countries, mostly. Um, Iceland stands out. Again, it follows the very similar patterns of policies that you see in Nordic countries. So what are the key drivers? Why is Finland, why are countries such as Iceland doing quite well? The answers are not, frankly, um, new. I think we all recognize them. It's all about the pro-female labor force participation national policies. The issues that uh, the previous speaker spoke about, the minister spoke about, it's around the duration and provision of maternity, paternity, and shared leave to allow a more balanced work life for mothers to be able to take care of children but also at the same time to go to work. Uh, if you dig down into the surveys, the effectiveness of the policies range. Uh, the policies themselves range. For example, in Asia and the Pacific, the average duration of maternity leave is around 18 weeks, with Australia offering over 50 weeks of maternity leave. If you look at the US, the average is two weeks, uh, but yet they have quite flexible schedules that allow mothers to go to work as well as take care of the family. They also encourage fathers to spend some time uh, and we have followed as an institution some of these policies. We have something that we call alternative work schedule where you take every other Friday off. Uh, the minister mentioned Wednesday, we have Friday and this allows mothers and or fathers to spend more time with the children. The benefits offered during uh, maternity and paternity leave seem to make a huge difference uh, in some of the countries such as Canada uh, and some of the Nordic countries you have a huge social spending on social security on insurance on paid maternity leave and that has actually proven to be effective child care assistance most of the companies you know with the high female representation on boards they have child care services in the vicinities and that makes um, uh, uh, life a bit easier for parents. Uh, I work in Songdo, our office is in uh, POSCO building and one of the things that really impressed me when we move into the offices is POSCO actually has a very nice childcare facility on the third floor and as a result you can actually see mothers in the morning coming to work with their children in a very safe place, but also fathers going to pick their children from the childcare. So those types of policies are consistent, which you're starting to see in Korea, are consistent with what you are seeing in countries such as Finland and France. Taxation system, the incentives structure, you know, getting tax returns, benefits when you do take care of your family. But the whole notion is really around promoting a work-life balance. In conclusion, therefore, I would like to note that the female labor participation is absolutely central to growth. I mean, the data is very clear. It speaks to itself. But more importantly, the proposition is mutual beneficial, both for economic growth, but also for the families. Secondly, it is possible to advance and or sustain the agenda at the country and global level. The fact that Nordic countries such as Finland have actually managed to sustain, it is possible. It can be done and it is possible. Companies such as POSCO, such as ours, 
have also instituted similar type of policies. So you could do at the micro level or at the macro level. Lastly, which I think is very important, we do not need to reinvent the wheel. There, are, there is enough literature out there that shows what works, what doesn't work, and this is a huge resource for countries such as Korea that can study, can look across the globe and see what works for Korea and customize for Korea. So in that regard, I wish to thank again the participants and everyone for listening to me. Thank you very much.